Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library. I'm really glad you all are here on behalf of our partners, the Carter Center and uh, Acapella Books. I want to welcome you to tonight's uh, discussion that I personally think is is really important. Um, I, years and years ago, I used to be a reporter and uh, was based in Dallas, and we covered stories of people coming across the southern border. Uh, but I never thought at the time about family separation, and that's something that uh, we learned a lot about uh, in the, the last couple of years. And we've got people who, who I think uh, can really put it in perspective. Efren Olivares is a deputy legal director for Immigrant Justice Project at the Southern Poverty Law Center. He was the lead lawyer in a successful landmark petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on behalf of families separated under the zero tolerance policy. And the stories, I'll tell you, the stories that he tells in his book, My Son Will, will Die of Sorrow, um, will, will really grab your heart and you'll hear about about that uh, tonight. His writings on immigration policy have been published in the New York Times, USA Today, Newsweek, and he's testified before Congress on immigration and, and border issues. And we were looking for someone to, to talk to him about that, that, that really understood that. And I don't think we could have found a better person than uh, Laura uh, Rivera. She's the director of the Southern Poverty Law Center Southeastern Immigrant Freedom Initiative. She spent the last decade working with immigrant communities to promote and defend human rights. Um, previously, she worked uh, as a journalist in New York and in her native uh, uh, Puerto Rico. And you know, it's fitting that we're here at the Carter Center because human rights is one of the, the things that is one of the priorities of President Jimmy Carter. So please join me in welcoming Efren Oliveres and Laura Rivera. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. And first things first, congratulations to you, Efren, on this amazing book. Um, I wanted to start off in your hometown of Allende, where you grew up with your dad, Julio, mom, Idalia, your little brother, Hector, and three half-siblings that were older than you. And, it just seemed like this magical place with green rolling hills and you live on De La Rosa Street and your mom tends this beautiful garden. Um, take us back there and tell us what it was like in the early days and what pushed your family make the difficult decision to migrate? Yeah, so I grew up, it's a small town in the state of Nuevo León in northeastern Mexico of about 35,000 people. So a tiny town and growing up, I don't know, the first eight, nine years of my life, moving to the United States was never an option, was never in the cards as far as I knew. Um, I had some aunts and uncles who were in the States in Texas, but everyone on my mom's side of the family to this day is still in Mexico. And I saw myself as growing in Mexico, even you know, from the time I thought I wanted to become a lawyer. It was in Mexico, right? That, that's what I had in mind. And my, my father and my uncle in their early years had been truck drivers and they had um, built up their business, their truck driving business into what I understand was a pretty successful business in the 70s. But then right around the time my father married my mother, I don't know why, I don't know if it was a midlife crisis that they had or what, but they decided to sell that business and, you know, put together a band, a uh, Norteño band in, in Mexico that just never, never made it. And they, you know, burned through the proceeds of selling their business. And then, you know, I was at the time nine years old. My father was 48 when, you know, he moved to the States in search for work. Luckily, he was able to get his 
US citizenship because his own father, my grandfather, had been born in Texas. Now, I don't get into this in the book, but I don't know how true that is because he was born in 1902 in South Texas and to a midwife. So whether that birth certificate is, you know, what it's supposed to be, I don't know. Uh, but there is a legitimate birth certificate from a midwife that got him his U.S. citizenship and then my father his citizenship. And had my father gotten around to doing the paperwork in time, if he had been a U.S. citizen by the time I was born, we would have been born U.S. citizens, the children of a U.S. citizen. But he didn't do that until after we were born, so we didn't get that benefit at birth. And so he was able to move to, to Texas in search for, of work, and we, we couldn't go visit him. So he would only come back and, and visit us. Um, yeah, and he found a job as a school bus driver, uh, knowing what he knew how to do in Mexico, you know, drive trucks, drive a bus in this case. Um, yeah, so that was, and at the time, it didn't feel like it was anything remarkable. You know, in school, my friends, their parents went to work. My dad went to work and came back a few weeks later for a weekend or so. It's just fascinating to me what you talk about with the, the birth certificate and like how much of our lives depends on paperwork and stuff outside of our control. Like at the time, the border was more porous. At the time your dad is born, fast forward to your birth, now the border has hardened. He didn't get the citizenship. You can't even go up there for the weekend to visit until you go and file this paperwork and an immigration official says, yes, you can come in. It's so arbitrary. When people say, well, my grandparents, great grandparents came, but they did it the right way. It's never that straightforward. What was it back then? What was the right way back then? You know, when my grandfather and my grandmother were farm workers, coming to Texas and when my dad, uh, my grandparents' parents, my great-grandparents, the border was meaningless. If you wanted to work, if there was work, you would go and come back. There was no border patrol. There was no immigration law like we know it today. There wasn't even checkpoints for you know, anything. So at that point, coming the right way meant something completely different than what it might mean today. I just think about that time that you're apart from your dad, formative years for a child and a boy, um, looking up to this role model, and you know, you're know you nearing your first milestone. I remember this part in the book, you know, you're about to graduate from primary school, and you've been chosen for a really special honor, and you're not sure your dad is gonna be able to make it. And it was just poignant to me because it it was something about this immigrant experience of you wanting to make him proud and work extra hard, but also like you didn't want to ask for too much to make sure that he was there. Can you tell us about that part of the book and maybe read us a snippet? Happy to. So in this part of the story, my father has been gone for about a year and a half, almost two years. And he would come and visit us, you know, one week in a month or so when he could, and always for the weekend. I guess during summer vacations, a little bit longer. Um, but he wasn't there on, not only on the day to day, but he wasn't there for certain important events and things like that. So for my elementary school graduation, um, it was on a Friday, and that's when he would come, usually. When he did, it was, would be on Fridays. And I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it that weekend. So that's what this short excerpt is about. In the weeks leading up to the graduation, I worried constantly about whether my father would be able to attend. I never asked, of course. I had been taught not to be so imprudent. But I wondered every day whether he would be there to see me receive my certificate. My worry was not really whether he would make a special trip to attend the graduation, because I didn't allow myself that possibility. Rather, I anguished hoping the graduation would fall on a Friday when he was already scheduled to visit us. Many mornings in school, I stared longingly at the calendar hanging from our classroom wall, 
counting the Fridays that were left before graduation, doing my best to calculate, trying to see how things were looking. But since his visits were not always regular, I couldn't be sure. If my mother asked him to come, I never heard that conversation. If he made a, if he made a special unscheduled trip, I never found out. But to my great relief, my father traveled home the Friday of my graduation. He had missed both the school field trip the week before and the mass earlier that afternoon, but he made it to the ceremony in the evening and he saw me receive my certificate. And to me, that was what really mattered. Thank you for that, thank you. It's just, it reminds me of the stories I've heard from so many immigrant kids about it wasn't part of the plan when you know, mom or dad or parent just can't be there for those milestones. But what I also hear in the background is mom. Mom was there. Whether she worked something out with dad, I won't know. And I just think about, you know, what was it like for her those four years? She's responsible for bringing the two of you up. And yeah, dad's supporting you financially, but times are tough. It's not like she can put, you know, bake lobster and a ribeye on the table every night. And one thing that really struck me in the book is how she kind of sprinkles this fairy dust magic over everything and makes even like the most modest meal come off as this special thing. So I was hoping you could share some of the memories that you record in the book about your favorite meal at the time. Um, yeah, because I just feel like it was full of all my senses were alive reading that. Yes. So this, those reflections about what it must have been for my mother is really something that I didn't reflect on in any depth until I was writing the book. Thinking about, you know, medical emergencies that would come up and making decisions during difficult times and trying to make ends meet in between visits from my father. I, as a 9, 10, 11 year old, didn't think about any of that or even later until I was writing the book. So this um, scene is about um, when it was noticeable that my father was absent and when it wasn't. That he was indeed gone was most noticeable in the evenings when my mother tried to bolster our spirits by making what she pronounced was our favorite dinner dish, parecitos de manteca, little pairs of beef tallow. These pairs were a simple yet delicious concoction. Take two tortillas, rub some beef tallow on each of them, maybe get lucky and include a few tiny crumbs of beef that sank to the bottom when the broth was separated from the tallow, pair them together, and then warm them up in the comal, a thin griddle used to cook and warm tortillas. Be sure not to leave them on for too long because the tortillas might get toasted, becoming hard and crispy, and no one wants that. They are meant to be rolled into a long and tight taquito, evenly distributing the grease. The tallow should be fully melted and the tortillas piping hot, but still soft enough to be able to roll them. Sometimes the tallow would fall off the tortilla into the comal, releasing a hiss of steam and a wonderful smell that tempted my brother and me as we waited, shirtless, seated at the round kitchen table. We dined on these little pieces of heaven a couple of times a week, and some weeks more often, when my dad hadn't come home for a while. On the rare weekends when he returned, bringing chicken and a bread and bologna for sandwiches, my mom did not need to get as creative in the kitchen. How did you recall memories like that? Did you have to put yourself in some kind of like meditative trance state to just be surrounded by all of that? Or was it pretty close top of mind? You know, this particular memory, for some reason it, it stuck with me and it came back often even before I was thinking of writing the book. Um, when my dad wasn't around, it used to be kind of the Sunday night dinner, the Sunday night dish, like a treat. And to my, I don't know, I felt very validated. I don't know if validated is the word, but while I was writing the book, when I had already written this scene, but hadn't finished, just in conversation with my brother, we were at my brother's house and my mom is there and my brother kind of half jokingly told her, it's like, 
do you remember like what, what you would feed us? Do you remember just tortillas in Greece? Like you remember that? <laughs> so I, I felt so good. Like it's not just in my head. Like <laughs> that, not only did that happen, but in retrospect, it was, yeah, my mom trying to find ways to not only make ends meet, but make something delicious out of the little that we had. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, so these four years go by, and I think about my nephews in, in this crucial age. They're 11 and 12, and just kind of like going through puberty, coming into their manhood, and you are finally at 13 going to be able to have the family back together again and be with your dad. And you do get into the book, or uh, in, in the book a little bit about the paperwork required and the frustrating sort of barriers to access. But what I remember most is that you were expecting this kind of like bright lights, big city moment, and there was gonna be like golden arches and like name brands. And you get to McAllen with your mom and brother and it's like flat and dusty and like the place where your dad is staying does not have a beautiful garden like your mom tended in Allende. Um, so what was that like for you, just this combination of like, yes, I'm finally like have my family intact again, but then the culture shock of coming to a place where, you know, you didn't dominate this, the language and people are randomly calling you Efren instead of Efren. When, when my father left, I don't, my brother, my younger brother and I, we didn't know if that was going to be the arrangement forever, that he was going to come visit sometimes, or that he was going to be working in Texas for a while and then come back, or that we would join him at some point in the future. But then at some point in between those four years, it became clear that we were going to join him, that we were going to move. So from that point forward, my younger brother and I, we really wanted to, can we go next week? Can we go now? Can we go now? We really wanted to be with my, with my father again. Uh, and I guess it's from watching TV or, I don't know, this idea of what going to the United States was. Lights and, I don't know, tall buildings, whatever going to the U.S. might be in the mind of a 10, 11-year-old Mexican boy. And then we, and, and my mom used to tease us in the morning when, you know, we're trying to have breakfast before going to school and we're all sleepy. It's like, when we go to McAllen, you're going to have to be up much earlier than this. And we're like, that's fine. It doesn't matter. We can do that. No problem. But then we got there, and, the, and this I remember noticing at the time when I was going through it. That, so we had our own house in Mexico. And then we get to McAllen, and my dad was, and my older brother, they were sharing a one-bedroom apartment where my mom and my brother and I got to stay. And... There was no backyard like we used to have in Mexico. We didn't know the neighbors like we did in Mexico. Didn't have any friends. Didn't have, it's like, wait a minute. Like, this is, this is odd. This was supposed to be better. And it wasn't better in the, in the material sense. Of course, we were very happy to be with my father. But I remember at the time thinking, this doesn't make sense. We're worse off. And what about school? Like, it sounded great to have your dad as bus driver and like nearby should you need him during the day, but that doesn't change the fact that it's drastically different, the whole experience of the system of education. Yes, and I was kept down a year because I didn't speak English. So in Mexico, I was in the equivalent of eighth grade, which is the second year in middle school in Mexico, but I was because I didn't speak English, I was kept down a grade and went into seventh grade. Um, no one told me why, no one explained anything. And ever since, frankly, I have felt like I'm catching up. Like I have to catch up. I went straight from undergrad to law school because I, I couldn't waste any more time. I've been catching up ever since in many ways. So one of the things you bring up is navigating your identity as like a friend a Mexican person with all of your cultural heritage and what that implies, but then also Efren, 
and how, how you're seen sometimes, frankly, and named, and um, carrying a little bit of, of guilt um, or shame even, uh, depending on the social context. Um, I don't want to say, like, have you worked out all those details, because identity is a dynamic thing, but looking back on it, what do you think that was about? I did not realize how much I had internalized Efren until I called, I introduced myself as Efren and some of my, in college, and some other Mexican friends called me out. I was like, what? <laughs> like, your name's Efren, like, what's, what's going on? And that, at that moment, I realized, and I frankly didn't think too much about it, and to this day, sometimes I still introduce myself. Uh, introduce myself as Efren if it's easier, given the context, than having to explain or trying to see if the person can roll the R or explain where the syllable accent should go. Sometimes it's just easier to blend in, and that's probably part of the, you know me being having grown up as a people pleaser. It's just easier. Efren is fine, um, and I think it's also. In writing the book, I reflected on, I think it was part of, of, you know, assimilating and trying to belong. If your name is not as weird or as different, if they can pronounce it, that's easier. It's easier to belong. So I think that may have something to do with it. And, you know, and, and my, Carla, my wife, is here and, you know, naming our own children. We thought about that. Like, how is, are people going to pronounce it in Spanish and in English? Make sure it's one that is kind of easy or it doesn't change too much. So I, I don't think I'm done you know, processing that or navigating that or figuring that one out. I, in some ways, I have come to terms with having different identities in different contexts, and I'm okay with that. So I don't know if I was reading too much into it, feeling like being like the new kid on the block and learning English that you had to kind of try extra hard to open certain doors that may not have automatically opened for you. But maybe you can tell me, but you talk about this teacher, Ms. Hernandez, and this experience of being like the newbie in school and you've already been held back. Now you need to know like, is your English good enough to even like go back to get caught up like you were saying. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if you carried that feeling even then, like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do this well enough. And um, I also want you to share with the audience that um, story when you go into Ms. Hernandez's office and she has this, like, test for you. Yes, so Ms. Hernandez was a counselor in the middle school where I came into seventh grade. And because I was kept down a year in most of the other subjects, I was good. Like math, no problem. I was ahead, right? I knew all the topics. And so in order to be out of the ESL curriculum and into the regular curriculum, I needed to pass a vocabulary test. And the test consisted of, it was a, like a children's board book and it had images on every page, four images, and I just had to name one on the page. And pick any one, name it in English, and then move on, right? So this scene is when I am taking that test, and I'm towards the end of the test. Okay, Ms. Hernandez said when she turned to the last page of the book. Esta es la última, vas muy bien. It was the last question, and I needed to get it right in order to pass. I looked down at the images on the page one by one and drew a complete blank. Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, nothing. I pushed myself up and back from the chair's plastic armrests and then pulled the chair forward to look at the images again. I lifted my gaze and met Ms. Hernandez's confident smile as she adjusted her glasses, her expression trying to project reassurance that didn't quite reach me. I went through the images again wished for a miracle as I glanced up at the cross on Ms. Hernandez's desk and then looked down at the page one more time. Nothing still. A faint herbal aroma that must have emanated from the potted plant behind her desk intensified the longer I stared at the images, incapable of coming up with a name. 
I later learned it was rosemary, and more than once that smell has transported me to that office and that test. After a long while, when Ms. Hernandez must have sensed my hopelessness, she leaned forward and got close to the book in front of me. Holding a pen between her index and middle fingers, she pointed at the image on the bottom right. It was a drawing of a zipper, like the one on a sweater, depicted by itself, halfway, halfway unzipped with a large pull tab in the middle. It was a zipper, I had no doubt, but I had no idea how to say zipper in English. I looked up at Ms. Hernandez, my nervous eyes trying to say, I know, but I don't know. She nodded and, smiling, tapped the image again with her pen a couple of times, as if confirming the instruction she was trying to convey. Our eyes met and she nodded again, like saying, come on, go for it. It was clear she wanted me to say, to guess, the word for zipper. I had no clue, so I did the only thing I could. See, I hesitated for a second. Ms. Hernandez still nodding. Zipper, I finally said, full of doubt. Eso, she exclaimed, delighted. Excelente, and her smile grew into outright laughter. I had said the Spanish word I knew for zipper, trying to make it sound like English and wishing for the best. Luck was part of it too. Had I been from Spain, where zippers are known as cremalleras, or even from central Mexico, where most people know them as cierres, the ploy wouldn't have worked. But I was fortunate that I had grown up calling zippers by the anglicism zippers, and Ms. Hernandez's nudge, smooth like and precise like the scalpel of a trained surgeon, worked perfectly. I did not appreciate all the implications in that moment, but thanks to that nudge, I passed the vocabulary test. Thanks to that, I entered regular English classes at the beginning of eighth grade that fall. And thanks to that, I was able to follow the standard curriculum and eventually pass the state's standardized test at the end of middle school. The help Ms. Hernandez gave me set in motion a chain of events that propelled my academic path into high school. Those two soft taps of the pen were more consequential than she likely ever knew. As with my sister Silvia, who exposed me to the alphabet ahead of my peers, I was now indebted to Ms. Hernandez for giving me that little push, for putting out a small ladder for me to step on and forge ahead. Thank you, I love that story so much. And I can really relate as a former ESOL kid, like being in like the office of this teacher who was trying to get me to learn like articles and you know how words in Spanish are gendered? And it's like, la silla, el reloj. And I just thought that I was gonna just map that right onto English and I got terribly scrambled. So it's like those moments of intensity where you're just, trying to rewire your brain, literally, to relate in this whole new language. It's, um, I felt myself in that zipper story so hard. Um, so yeah, we wanna fast forward through your amazing successes like you were referring to in that part of the story. You end up going to college at UPenn, you go to Yale Law School, and you dedicate yourself to being a human rights lawyer, return to McAllen, and it's kind of, it's the setting for the other part of the book that's talking about the very public family separation policy under the Trump regime of zero tolerance. So the way you set it up, you know, you're in McAllen, you get this call from a defense attorney who's like, I'm in the court, and I'm seeing migrants that are being brought into the courtroom, brought up on criminal charges of illegal entry, and they're telling me that before they were brought here today, they were torn apart from their kids, and they don't know what the heck is going on. So that's when you jump into action, and you actually go to the courthouse to try to get the story as best you can from folks in the very brief window before their hearings occur. And I want you to tell us what it was like going to the courthouse and what these folks were telling you about what had happened to them and their children. Yes, so this zero tolerance policy had been announced by the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions at a press conference in early May, saying that going forward, 
every person who crossed, quote, between ports of entry was going to be charged criminally. Now that law has been in the books since the 1920s that makes it a, a federal misdemeanor to cross the border between ports of entry. And it's a, it's a misdemeanor. It carries the same sentence as running a stop sign at the Pentagon. And people are hard, were hardly ever prosecuted for it. And people who were prosecuted for it would get what is known as time served. So if you were arrested two days prior, your sentence is two days. You already served it. If you run a, a stop sign at the Pentagon and that happens to you, you go to court and then you go home to your kids. What started happening here is that parents who had their children with them when they were taken to the courthouse to be prosecuted for this misdemeanor crime were separated from their children. And they relied on this legal fiction of, of under whose custody the parent was versus whose custody the child was. So instead of being in the custody of the Department of Homeland Security, the moment the parent went to court, they were in the custody of the Department of Justice, and therefore the child was unaccompanied, and the, that's how the separation happened. It was done very much deliberately to inflict as much pain and suffering on the families and to try to send a message to other immigrants. We did not know any of this at the time, and the first morning we went to the courthouse, we were still trying to figure out what our legal strategy might be, because as lawyers, you know, you can go to to a judge and ask for an emergency a restraining order or an injunction, something emergency. But what was the government doing that was quite, that was illegally exactly, right? Because they were prosecuting people for a crime and then referring them to ICE for their immigration proceedings. So both in the criminal context, they were following an established law that had been in the books for many years. And in the immigration context, they were, you know, as problematic as the process is, they were following the same process and using the same agency that had been around for a long time. But at, at a visceral level, it just didn't feel right. It, it, like, it, this cannot be right. This cannot be happening with no record of where the children were being kept. So when we went in that first morning, we had an intake form that we had put together, Georgina, our paralegal, and, and myself, just name of the parent, name of the children, date of birth, country of origin, because those three details are key in immigration to, to identify somebody, and then a bunch of blank lines to try to get the story as much as we could. And if they agreed, we could use that as, as an affidavit to do whatever we were going to do, because at the time we didn't yet know what legal action we might take with that. Mm -hmm. So we went in that first morning, and that is kind of how the book opens with what we found that day that I, you know, I don't want to spoil things, and for those who haven't read the book, but it was unlike anything I've ever seen before, and something that I was very much not ready for, yeah. not prepared for. So I remember this part of the book where there's almost a part of you that has to unplug or dissociate from the emotion of it all because you know that you've got, say, 10, 15 minutes with <laughs> dozens of people. So you're really triaging and you get kind of clinical about it. And you're going through the motions and you're talking to this guy. And you ask this guy uh, who's been separated from his kid, like, well, what do you think your kid would do if you're not able to be reunited. Because like in the back of your head, you're thinking, well, these folks might actually be deported without their child, and their child ends up in the foster care system in the US, and that did happen to very many children. So if you could share a little snippet of that part, because I think it was one of those moments where I can relate as a lawyer, like you put your guard up so that you can get through it, and then somebody says something that is like, a gut punch and an awakening all at once. You put your guard up and you're so focused on what you need for your legal case. I need your name, date of birth, how do you spell the last name. You're so focused on the details that those moments really caught, can catch you unprepared. So when this was happening, it was Georgina and me interviewing you know, parents by the, the witness stand and the corner of the courtroom as everyone else is there and right before the, the criminal hearing began. 
I was speaking to Lionel, who was also from Guatemala. He was less than a year younger than me and wore a plaid short sleeve shirt, white with dark and light blue lines and cowboy style buttons, the kind you snap together. He must have been no taller than five feet, seven inches. In broken Spanish, he explained that he had come with his 11 year old son, Daniel. Like Viviana and Sandro, another family, they were traveling alone and they were inseparable. He and Daniel were both first time crossers and had no family in the United States. They were hoping to apply for asylum due to the persecution they had faced in their indigenous village. I got all the critical information from Leonel, but I still couldn't believe that the agents had not given him any information about his son, where he was being taken or who would take care of him. Surely the agents must have told him something about the process and about what to expect, I thought. What do you think would happen, I asked Lionel, if you're deported and your son doesn't go with you, if he stays here? He looked down as if thinking about it. And when he looked up, he shook his head. His look was one of resignation. No, pues, mi niño se muere de tristeza. My boy will die of sorrow. For a second, my eyes didn't leave his. I struggled to write down what he was telling me. I pursed my lips and looked down, swallowed hard, and couldn't find the words to respond. I read the narrative back to Lionel, and when he agreed it was accurate, he signed his name using his left hand to push the shiny silver handcuffs higher on his skinny wrist to be able to sign. Well, that just hit me because I remember working with these parents and there's a certain point where you feel like paralyzed by all of the emotions in, in the air, so to speak, that they're going through and the utter sense of powerlessness that you have with the tools that are available to you. And I can't imagine on top of that being a parent myself. So you and your wife, Carla, had had your first child, Julian, and he was a toddler then. So I'm wondering how that impacted how you showed up with these clients and yeah, like how that colored your, the way that you move through these relationships as a dad yourself. Yeah, that, that side of, of the experience is something that I thought about a lot at the time. Unlike my childhood experiences and my experience immigrating to the, to the US, which I didn't really connect the dots on until many months later, once I started writing the book, that experience of, of having a 15-month-old son while I was doing this work um, is something that became a daily source of pain, I would say. Um, I'm sure all of you who have children and have taken them to school for the first time know what that's like, right? Either they don't stay or you get the phone call from the teacher. And I, that happened to us that, you know, Carla got the phone call an hour after she had dropped Julian off for preschool and she had to go pick him up. And that stark difference, right, of having that privilege of being able to go pick up our son from school and then, you know, comfort him and try to make him stop crying that everything was gonna be okay, that his mother was gonna be there with him. And in the morning, going to the courthouse and talking to parents who did not have that privilege, who did not know where their children were, and we could not even imagine what the children were thinking or feeling or going through. That. To this day, that part of it is, is very, very difficult. I think, though, that the emotions that it spark and awaken in people went far beyond the limited legal tools that we had at our disposal at the time to actually rectify the horrors of zero tolerance and actually restore the families to wholeness. Um, so tell us about some of the tools that you tried at the time, legal and not just legal, and, and what do you think actually worked and why? 
So as I was saying earlier, we hadn't figured out the legal strategy that first day, but we quickly decided that we did not want to do a TRO, a temporary restraining order. Restraining order. We thought it was hard to win, and even if we won, we thought a court of appeals would likely reverse it, so it was challenging. And we ultimately decided to go to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Because from the human rights perspective, regardless of what the criminal law says or the immigration law says, the human rights framework, and in particular thinking of the best interest of the child, gave us a legal hook. And the strategy from the beginning was to file this petition. We were under no illusion that the Inter-American Commission, unfortunately, was going to move very quickly. But it gave us a legal hook that we could then use to try to do public advocacy and share the stories of these families, those who consented to having their stories shared. Um, and we started doing that, trying to go to court every day and share the story of, of a mother with a six-year-old child with special needs who are still separated. Uh, a mother who, who was separated from her baby while she was breastfeeding him, and other horrible, horrible stories to try to get public outrage around against this policy. And it seemed to work some days and not work other days. And certainly the outrage was not enough to stop the policy because it kept happening. And we would go the, the following Monday and 25 parents that morning, and then afternoon shift. That was the other thing. We had two shifts. I kept thinking all through that June, there's got to be an agent who has a conscience, who's going to have access to these families, to these cages, and is going to leak a short video, a picture of the children there, even if it means risking his job or her job. There's got to be one. I kept waiting for that. And it never crossed my mind that it would be an audio that was going to ultimately leak. And that audio which is an eight minute long audio of the children crying in, in the Ursula Detention Center. And it's so painful to listen to. But that was the turning point. That is what really sparked enough public outrage that two days later, the president signed an executive order supposedly ending the separations. We can talk about how that really didn't end them, but it certainly decreased the, the number significantly. And the reason I think that audio sparks so much outrage is because when you listen to the children crying and only hear their voices, all children cry the same. And you don't see the color of their skin. It's not as easy to other them, to think of them as different from your own children. You just hear their cries, and it could be your own children. It could be yourself when you were a child. And I think. That is why even the proponents of this policy, maybe not the proponents, but those who justified it under the guise of, well, the parents shouldn't have crossed the border. I think even for them, at that point, this was too much. It was as if we had gone over a line that we had gone over long before. But hearing that audio made it so visceral that even those folks were against it. And then it was the beginning of the reversal of this policy. I think what you said there is, you know, a bit of tough love for a country that likes to think of itself as a beacon of human rights. And I think overall with the book, you know, you push us to look at family separation in a broader light and see how it has happened over the course of history in the United States during enslavement and how it continues to happen through the generations to migrants and to people who aren't migrants. And this whole phenomenon of othering acts as a justification. So first we other, and then we can justify our lack of compassion. Um, what do you want your readers to reflect on when it comes to that awful dynamic of othering and compassion? Before writing the book, I did not know the history of immigration and immigration laws in this country that well. And I was surprised to find out how common family separation has been in the United States, especially when it comes to immigrants who are not deemed to be white. We often romanticize or idealize immigrants of the past, 
um, those who you know, founded, forget about the ones who founded this country or those who came through Ellis Island. But if you look into Ellis Island, there were cages there and children were put in cages, children who might be considered white today but weren't considered white then. It just so happens that today we have a level of, of information sharing that is unprecedented and that audio was able to make it out of those cages. Um, what I hope this book pushes the readers to, to grapple with is the idea of why we feel compassion for certain people and not for others. Why is it that the cries of those children really tugged at the heartstrings of many people, but not the cries, not the cries of the parents or the plight and the suffering of certain adult immigrants? Take Ukrainian asylum seekers and not others. What is it? And, and I, I do it myself, right? Why is it that certain stories, certain human stories, certain lives, we seem to look at differently? And, and is it immigration status? Is it, is it the idea of borders, that they were born outside of how we define borders today? Immigration status, language, skin color. What is it that drives us to feel compassion for a fellow human being? Um, and if people grapple with that question and try to answer it in whatever way it, it fits for their own personal circumstance, I will be very, very pleased. I think it's as relevant a question now as it was in 2018 under the current administration and with migration cycles and crises continuing at our border and not just at our border because now our border is within 100 miles of any lander, uh, air, or seaport, right? And that's the majority of the US population. So um, thank you so much for that. I think now we can turn it to the audience for questions. And you'll notice there's one microphone on one side and then another one over here. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, please don't be shy. Come on up and ask. Um, yeah. Efren, I have a question for you uh, to share some advice with us, your colleagues being advocates for immigrants. Um, having gone through the experience that you have and also representing people, how do you deal with a vicarious trauma of representing those people? And as you just mentioned, having been in the same in the situation that you have your wife, you have your kids, and going home and looking at your children and you know being fortunate we have them here, you know, how do you how do you deal with this vicarious trauma? And what advice do you have for us as advocates who are uh, in this journey in the same battle with you? Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I'm still working on it, truthfully. Um, I was sharing with somebody that writing the book was therapy, and they promptly corrected me that, that no, that it may have been therapeutic, but it wasn't therapy. So uh, I still need to do that. Um, but I, I think another um, one piece of advice that I, I have taken to heart on that is that, especially in this work, we. I'll speak for myself. I tend to put up the guardrails and um, you know get the, the lawsuit filed or finish this job. Just focus on the facts and the arguments, and it's easy to put you know guardrails around the emotional side of it. The risk with doing that is that then those guardrails can also prevent us from experiencing the joy that it feels when you're able to make a difference for another human being. So I try to hold on to that. Um, I, it's, it's hard to do this work right now in the United States, given, uh, as a lawyer in particular, as a litigator. It's, it's challenging to think about what the next 10, 20, 30 years might look like. But the way I think of it is, one, trying to be creative in how we use the legal tools that we have still, and also, being a human being at the same time, right? And experiencing all of these emotions that make us human, the challenging ones and the ones that 
give us happiness and joy and you know family members and and trying to make the best of that in the one life we've got okay we have another question uh yes uh once again thank you for coming this has been very uh enlightening um i have a coworker who had a similar story where his father was here in the united states and he came from guatemala via his mother uh, basically in a tomato truck as they crossed the border at the bottom of a pile of tomatoes. Um, he spoke a lot about what was going on in Guatemala at the time. Do you care to touch on the instance that you shared a little while ago where you were representing somebody who was being persecuted in his uh, indigenous community uh, to kind of help shed light on why people make this migration? Yes. So one of the, thank you for the, for the question. One of the stated intentions of the zero tolerance policy was to make it so miserable and so difficult for families who came to dissuade others from coming. As if immigrants in other countries are paying attention to the immigration laws of the United States or the White House press releases or press conferences. And this notion that people choose to leave their home country, their family, the way of life as they know it, their culture, their language, is just completely misguided. People leave their homes because that's the last resort they have. It's the last option, and it's the only option in many cases to save their lives or their families' lives. And you know, Guatemala in particular is a country with extreme, extreme discrimination, uh, racial discrimination in particular against indigenous peoples. And a lot of the indigenous clients that we've that I've worked with over the years are fleeing that level of persecution. Uh, both at the hands not only of private actors, such as organized crime, but in many cases, state actors, police officers, etc. So it is a desperate move when somebody leaves their home and travels across another country or multiple countries with only you know, the clothes and what they've got in their backpack. It's, it's a desperate, desperate situation. And it's the reasons, the, the factors that push them to leave not the factors that really pull them from the United States, this or that immigration policy. I uh, wanted to just ask one question. Um, Tony, do you want to cut in here? Yeah, I was just going to follow up. How do the families weigh the risk mm. um, to knowing the risk of trying to get into this country uh, and the obstacles to get here, as you were describing, how do they weigh those those risks? One of the families in in the book that I still uh, am in touch with, and this will be a bit of a spoiler from chapter one. Sorry, um, it was a mother that we interviewed that first day in court, and. Georgina was interviewing her and asking her about her son, her 11-year-old son. And one of the questions we were asking is, did you leave your home country for a reason? Oftentimes, people answer that question to come to work so as to not be perceived as coming for a handout. But what we're trying to get at is not why did you, what did you come here to do, but rather why did you leave your home country? And she shared that her husband, um, had been murdered in Guatemala, and the, he was an, uh, an activist in the teachers' union, and the murderers were now after her and her 11-year-old son. She had no other family and had to leave. I don't think she made any risk assessment or you know pros and cons analysis. It was an act of desperation to save herself and her son. And I think for most immigrants, that is what happens, especially those asylum seekers, those who are fleeing persecution and violence and death threats. It's not a calculation where you, know, you write down on one column the benefits and another the risks. It's, it's an, ask, an act of desperation and survival in, in many cases. I mean, you think of the families who got into that trailer tractor, in, in tractor trailer, excuse me, in Texas they did not have the opportunity to assess the risks that that presented. It's an act of desperation. We have one more question over here. 
Um, yeah, I'm a mental health counselor, and um, I am curious to know from the perspective of somebody who's experienced family separation, um, those parents or people who care about some of these children or people who are in my line of work and might um, be working on helping the children, do you have any advice, any, um, any kind of inside perspective that would help um, us be more sensitive or more thoughtful in our way of um, interacting with these kids? Whew, thank you for the question. Hi, baby. Um, th that is way outside of my area of expertise. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I have shared with my former colleagues at, at the Texas Civil Rights Project that oftentimes I feel guilty and that it was irresponsible for us to jump into this work the way we did with zero training on trauma-informed work and the vicarious trauma and all of those things. Um, the only thing I can share from my personal experience, this is not medical advice or counseling or anything like that, but that it often takes a while to develop a relationship with a person. They're not likely to share their deepest traumas on the first conversation. So it takes building that rapport, that trust. Um, and in many of these cases, when, inter when we interviewed these families, we only had five minutes with them, five to 10 minutes, and we never saw them again. So that made it even more and more difficult um, I, I think for many, I, I can share another very difficult um, anecdote that is in the book about a, a family, a mother who we didn't even interview in McAllen, but my phone number got around the detention facility and she called me one day and I picked up and she had crossed through another city in Texas and was trying to find out what happened to her daughter. So we took down her information and her daughter's information, name, date of birth, country of origin, to try to find her at the shelter and then arrange for a phone call. Talked to her a couple of times whenever she would call me every few days. And then at one point she called and um, I asked her if she had been able to, to talk to her daughter. And she started crying, bawling on the phone. So I, I remember feeling extremely frustrated, right? That the phone call hadn't happened. Why, after all this time, wouldn't the bureaucrats just arrange the phone call so that this mother can, can talk to her daughter? And after she was able to you know, break through her tears and speak again, she said, no, no, we, we, spoke. we spoke yesterday. OK, that, then what was the issue, right? Like, why, why are you crying? What happened? Well, we got five minutes, and we both spent the five minutes crying. And my daughter kept asking me, Mommy, why did you leave me? Why won't you come and get me? What does a six-year-old know about zero tolerance or border or ports of entry, right? So that is just to put ourselves in the, in the try to put ourselves in the minds and hearts of, of a child is, is impossible. Are there other questions? Well, I, this has been a fascinating and I think at the same time heartbreaking uh, discussion of what happens on the border. Um, let's thank Efren and Laura. <laughs> Efren's going to be uh, signing copies of his book down front. In front, Acapella Books has copies of them for sale in the lobby. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and thank you very much.